William Morris was born into the Industrial Revolution at the height of the British Empire. He wanted to be a doctor, but his farmer father was neither well nor wealthy and moved the family into town where he worked as a clerk. The oldest of seven children, William left school at 14. The family needed the wage he could earn. He convinced his family that the future lay in bicycles and enrolled for night school classes in engineering. With four pounds in startup capital, he began repairing and then making bicycles from the family's working class home in James Street in Oxford. He became a champion racer across three counties, building his own bicycles. But the march of progress meant bicycles weren't enough, and with a partner, Morris built his first motorcycle. But his partner shied away from the risk, leaving William to go it alone, learning a valuable lesson in the process, not to rely on other people. He scraped together what money he could and established a garage in 1910 and designed his first car, the bull-nosed Morris Oxford, in 1912. In 1914, a coupe and van were added to the lineup, but the chassis was too short and the 1,000cc engine too small to make a much-needed four-seater version. The engine suppliers wanted more money than Morris was willing to pay for a larger version, so he turned to America for a 1,500cc engine. In spite of the outbreak of the First World War, the orders were maintained and, in 1919, 400 cars were built. By 1925, annual output was 56,000. In 1924, the head of the Morris sales agency, Cecil Kimber, started building sporting versions of Morris cars called MG. MG is best known for its two-seat open-top sports cars, but also produced saloons and coupés. From the earliest days, MGs have been used in competition, and from the early 1930s, a series of dedicated racing cars were made and sold to enthusiasts who received factory assistance. This stopped in 1935 when MG merged with Morris Motors and the competition department closed down. A more modern and comfortable car, the MGB, was released in 1962 and produced until 1980. MG was in production for 56 years, mostly building two-seater sports cars. Herbert Austin had set up in the car business in 1910, and by 1914 his 2,300 workers were making 1,000 cars a year. But Austin made little profit from its wartime effort. Demand for new cars was low, and many workers were laid off. Austin was on the brink of bankruptcy. His fellow directors didn't like his idea of a baby car to revive the company's fortunes, so undeterred, he designed it at home. Launched in 1922, the Austin 7 was revolutionary, a stylish, economical and reliable car at a low price. Car ownership was no longer just for the wealthy. From 1918 to 1924, Sir Herbert was a Conservative MP, but he never made a speech in the House of Commons. He died in 1941 at the age of 74 from a heart attack and pneumonia. In 1952, Morris merged with its old rival Austin to form the British Motor Corporation, and for years various brands would be seen on families of similar vehicles. J.K. Starley made history in 1885 by producing the Rover Safety Bicycle, a rear-wheel drive, chain-driven cycle with similar-sized wheels. After developing the template for the modern bicycle, the company moved into powered transport, building first motorcycles, then cars, and using the motif of a Viking longship. The company developed the Rover Imperial motorcycle in November 1902. Rover began making cars with the two-seater Rover 8, and the 12-horsepower model was introduced in 1912. Building on successes like beating the blue train for the first time in 1930, Rover had royal, aristocratic, upper-middle-class and star clients. But immediately after the war, times were tough. There was a lot of reconstruction to be done, but shortages of almost all commodities and the cash to pay for them. Luxury cars weren't high on many people's shopping lists. Rover knew they needed a new approach to find new markets, especially overseas. Inspired by an American World War II Jeep that he had used one summer at his holiday home in Wales, Rover's chief designer, Morris Wilkes, sketched a rugged new go-anywhere vehicle. And so was born the Land Rover. 
The square bodies were constructed of a lightweight, rust-proof alloy of aluminium and magnesium called Bermabrite. This material was used because of the post-war steel shortage and the plentiful supply of post-war aircraft aluminium. Within five months, the first prototypes were undergoing testing and the cars were launched at the Amsterdam Motor Show in 1948. They were shown to be hardy and with high and low range gearboxes and large ground clearances, there were few places a Land Rover couldn't reach. The body's resistance to corrosion was one of the factors that built the Land Rover's reputation for longevity in the toughest conditions. Land Rover once advertised that 75% of all the vehicles they ever built are still in use, and Land Rover drivers sometimes refer to other makes of 4x4s as disposables. The early choice of colour was dictated by military surplus supplies of aircraft cockpit paint, so early vehicles only came in various shades of light green. The early vehicles were designed to be field-serviced. Advertisements for Rovers cite vehicles driven thousands of miles on banana oil. The use of Land Rovers by the British and Commonwealth military, as well as on long-term civilian projects and expeditions, is mainly due to the Mark's off-road performance. For example, the short wheelbase Land Rover could climb a gradient of 45 degrees, and a feature of all Land Rovers is exceptional axle articulation, allowing them to maintain contact and traction on uneven surfaces. Come the 1960s, and the privations of the post-war period were largely forgotten. A new market for four-wheel drive vehicles was evolving, one which included leisure and recreation. Taking notice of what was happening in the USA, Land Rover started work on what would become yet another worldwide sales success, the Range Rover. Launched in 1970, here was a vehicle as robust as its cousin the Land Rover when driven off-road, yet offering a refined ride when driven on-road. The Range Rover introduced features like self-leveling suspension, a powerful V8 engine, and a four-wheel drive system that didn't feel like you were driving a truck. Still selling well over 40 years later, the regularly updated Range Rover is an icon of British engineering, which has been imitated by many other manufacturers. Top-of-the-range models pack in the luxury features and latest technology, with prices to match, but families like the space, versatility and comfort. The Range Rover was a key part of Land Rover's revival in the 1980s and spearheaded the brand's return to the all-important American market.